I wonder how you would answer if someone asked you to sum up the message of the Bible in two words. Perhaps you would say, Jesus Christ. And it would be hard to argue with that one. Perhaps you would say, law and grace. That too is a good answer. Perhaps you would say repentance and faith. Well done you, that's, uh, that's all right as well. But I think if someone put the question to me, if I were asked to sum up the message of the Bible in two words, I think the two words I would use would be judgment and mercy. It's really the message of both Old and New Testaments alike. In the Old Testament, just take the prophet, Jonah, for instance. He comes to Nineveh. And as he walks the streets of that vast Assyrian city, he preaches a simple message. It's the message of the Bible. Judgment and mercy. You remember his message, don't you? Strange, isn't it? You don't remember mine from last week, but you remember Jonah's from centuries ago. What did he say? Forty days, and Nineveh will be destroyed. And in that, we see the essential message of the Bible, judgment. Nineveh will be destroyed, and mercy. Forty days. In in the New Testament, for instance, you can look at the writings of the apostles, especially of the apostle Paul, and he will say, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. And then he will say, but God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And there it is, the essential message of the Bible. Judgment. The wages of sin is death. And mercy, the gift of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ, his Son. It's the message of Malachi as well. Last week we were talking about the fact that God is going to come with a purifying, purging judgment. And if you didn't feel a little uneasy about the message, and if it didn't create a little bit of uh, disquiet within your heart and mind, perhaps, Uh, Either we weren't preaching clearly enough or you weren't receiving the message clearly enough. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And the thought of our God who is a consuming fire coming to purify and purge his people is the sort of thing that ought to cause us to really stop and take stock of where we stand with the Lord and to consider our position before him. That's judgment. Ah, but the essential message of the Bible is not just judgment. It's also mercy. And so we have to really love those words that he speaks to us today. Return to me. Aren't those beautiful words? Return to me. It's not that God is fed up with his people and he wants to send them away. He says, return to me. It's not that he's finally washed his hands of us and he's going to have nothing more to do with us. He says, return to me. 
It's not that he's so fed up that he's going to disown us entirely and, you know, make no other claim to being our God or for us being his people. No, he says, return to me. That's what the text is about today. He began there in verse 6. He says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me. Do you hear that? Return to me. What a, what a, a statement of mercy. What a, a declaration of the loving kindness of God. Return to me and now listen to this promise. And I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. I've not gone anywhere. I've not changed. I'm still here. Return to me. I will return to you, says the Lord. But they responded by saying, how shall we return? Now, I I want to suggest, you don't have to agree, but I, I want to suggest that they are beginning to break. We're beginning to see some cracks in their composure. We're beginning to see their resistance and their intransigence broken down. I don't think at this point when they say, uh, how shall we return, that this is the, the type response that they were giving earlier. Like when God would say, you know, I have loved you. And they say, how have you loved us? Or, you know, you have wearied me. And they say, how have we wearied you? I think when he says, return to me, the kindness of God is beginning to lead them to repentance. And so I'm prepared. You know, love does hope all things, believes all things, endures all things. I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. And I think that perhaps they're saying, how shall we return? How can we return? How can we come back to you? And he answers the question in a very strange way. He answers the question not by asking them in very polite terms to review their giving, but he asks them in very blunt terms to stop robbing God. Now that sounds a bit blunt, doesn't it? And so immediately now they're on the defensive again and they're saying, well, how are we robbing God? And he said, in your tithes and in your contributions. And you say, oh, yeah, just as I thought, God's always after money, you know, and the self-serving, self-seeking Uh, Preachers and prophets, that's ultimately what it comes down to. You know, it's all about the money. And in one sense, you're not far off. Because there are two ways that you can really tell what a person's priorities are. Look at their diary. Look at their bank statement. Because how we spend our time and how we spend our money tells us a lot about how we're investing our life and also tells us a lot about where our trust is placed. You see, these people felt a bit hard done by. They they really did. They had returned from Babylonian captivity you know, a hundred years before. 
They had a temple of sorts, but it was built on the cheap. You know, it's built quickly and there's almost a planned obsolescence built into it. It didn't compare to the grandeur of Solomon's temple, not one little bit. And yeah, by now they've got some walls. They've actually been repaired rather than rebuilt. And they were not actually, you know, uh, done by a professional tradesman. But, uh, you know, it was, it was volunteer, including women and children. In fact, one person assessed it and said, well, even if a fox walked on it, you know, it, it, it would fall over. And, and yeah, they're, they're, having, they're having services again in the temple, and they're offering uh, sacrifices, but it's not the way it used to be. Not nearly as many people come. No, they don't. And people who do come, it seems as though their hearts are not really in it. They, they, bring, they bring their sacrifices, but it's no longer the best. I mean, they offer blind and blemished lambs rather than pure and, and spotless lambs. And they, they bring a portion of the tithe, but they've actually held back, you know, most of it because uh, you really can't depend on God. You know, he's let us down before and we need to keep a little, you know, back just in case of uh, an emergency because really, end of the day, we're depending on ourselves And he says, return to me. Be fully invested with your time and with your money. Return to me. Be all in in terms of your identification with me and my people. Return to me. Stop giving me halves. Stop giving me the fag ends of life and just come back to me. And he said, I'll come back to you. And I think they're intrigued by this suggestion. And I think they want to know how. So I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. It's a genuine question. Let's see if there's some genuine answers. Well, first of all, I, th I think the, the, the answer that we, we should see is that they return to him through repentance of sin. Through repentance of sin. And, and, and a couple of things here to note about uh, repentance of sin. It, it's, it's really uh, what I want you to see in verse 7. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. What's that about? That's about sin. And there are, in the first instance, some sins of commission. You have turned aside from my statutes. And say the sins of commission. And he says that you need to return to me by repenting of these sins of commission. But they're not only these sins of commission. There are also sins of omission when he says plainly, you've not only turned aside from my statutes, that's commission, but you have not kept them, that's omission. And he says, I want you to stop rebelling against me. Now, it's, it's very important to note this. He's just said in verse 6, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. For from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Why is he making this point of referring to them again as the children of Jacob? Why is he dredging up all of these things from the past and talking about how from the days of their fathers, they have turned aside from his statutes? How did Malachi begin? I mean, the letter, the, the book, the, the prophecy. Jacob have I loved. And he says, you are the sons of Jacob. You are the ones whom I have chosen. You are the ones whom I have called. You are the ones upon whom I have set my affections. I love you. And you keep rebelling against me. I love you and you keep going away. 
I love you. You keep pushing me away. I love you and you keep rebelling. Stop rebelling against God. This is repentance of sin. And so having just said, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them, he says, return to me. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. And so it's not only this matter of stop rebelling against God, but then he moves on to uh, another sin, and that is to stop robbing God. And and that's what happens when we see uh, there in the verses following. But you say, uh, how shall we return? In verse 8, he asks the question, will a man rob God? But you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you're cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. He says, stop robbing me. So what are they doing? They are not bringing the full tithe into the storehouse. They are not bringing all that they were required to contribute before the Lord. It's not that they weren't doing anything. It's just that they weren't doing what they ought to be doing. In fact, what they had actually been commanded to do in the law. And he says, what I want you to do is to stop hedging your bets. What I want you to do is to stop leaving yourself that little bit of wiggle room and that little bit of spiritual flexibility that you can also trust in yourself. You don't have to trust exclusively in the Lord. And he said, I want you to be I want you to be all in. I want you to be fully invested. I want you to return to me. And the best way that you can demonstrate that you are all in, that you're fully invested, is is actually by your giving. I I was reminded that, that John Wesley said, the last part of a man to be converted is his wallet. I was uh, thinking recently about my first baptism. I, I guess it's just a feature of getting a bit older. You become a bit nostalgic and you're thinking a bit more about the past. Hard for me to imagine, but in a year, in, in a year, I will, have been, I will have been a pastor for 40 years. You didn't even think I was 40, but I've, I've been a pastor for 40 years next year. And next summer uh, will be the 40th anniversary of my first baptism. Hard for me to imagine that now the, the person that uh, I, I baptized, you know, will be 70 years old. But so here I am. And my first baptism is in a river. Now, we had a baptistry in the church, but this person requested to be baptized in a river. And his uh, thinking was, you know, it was good enough for Jesus. It was good enough for him. He wanted to be baptized in a river. And so, fair enough, there was a river nearby, And it was agreed that the baptism would be held at the river. And so here we are. Uh, We go down after the Sunday morning service, and um, I go out into the water, 
and the uh, man begins uh, to uh, come out and I notice just about the time that he's almost hip high that he has not removed his wallet. And so it was my first baptism. It was the first baptism I had ever seen in a river. And so I'm not familiar with the protocol and the decorum of such an occasion. And so I said to him, uh, Dean, you forgot your wallet. Take your wallet out and hand it back to someone else. And the man who was sort of the... Um, not official in any sense, but the de facto leader of the church said, no, no, pastor, leave him alone. The wallet needs to be baptized too. (laughs) He might have had a point. Has your wallet been baptized? Now, I'm not talking about sprinkling. I'm talking about full immersion. We're Baptist, mind you. Has has your wallet been baptized? Are you all in? Are you fully invested? Are you trying to make a point with your giving? Are you holding a bit back to show your dissatisfaction with things? Are your displeasure with things? Or are you saying, I'm all in, fully invested? You see, when you withhold part of what belongs to the Lord, you don't really um, hurt the church. And you certainly don't hurt God. Because God doesn't need anything from anyone. He's completely self-sufficient. And you don't really hurt the church because, uh, yes, there is the need for his house to be full. There is the need for the needs of the church to be met. But in reality, uh, God is faithful and uh, he's going to meet the needs of his people one way or another. You've seen that. We've all seen that. We're long enough in the tooth to know that. You really hurt yourself, don't you? Because you're depriving yourself of the opportunity to be fully invested in what the Lord is doing in the world today through his church. You're robbing God. He's not pleased with that. And it shrinks your soul. Makes you miserly, stingy, greedy, all in. Fully committed. How's the old saying, Albert? Putting your money where your mouth is. That's good. We talk a good talk. He says, stop robbing me. Bring it all. Commit it all to me. That's repentance. Now, it's interesting, really interesting here. That if we fail to repent, that means that judgment is upon us. He says, you know, know, you're, you're under a curse. There's a devourer. And 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 you're subject to my displeasure. Need to repent of your sins. Stop rebelling against me. I love you. Stop robbing me. I've given you everything that you've got. Repent. No, no, and I I do have to move on, but I, I, I do want to say... Some people say, well, this is, in, this is the, the Old Testament, this is the Old Covenant, and there's nowhere in the New Testament that we are, we are, are, are required you know, by the law to tithe and... Excuse me. I didn't say that this was a message about tithing. This is a message about trusting. I 
I think the reality is that we have to recognize that under grace, we're not given a specific percentage. We're actually given multiple percentages. Zacchaeus was given a percentage. 50. Yep. The widow who came to the temple treasury was given a percentage. 100. He said, could we talk a little bit more about that 10? That's sounding a, you know, that's sounding a little better now. Well, the, the reality is grace is not going to desire less than the law requires. Under the law, they were compelled to give ten, but under grace, well, they even sold their houses and lands. They gave all. Under the law, they were compelled to spend one day in, in, in worship, and, and yet uh, uh, under grace, well, they met together daily, publicly and from house to house. Because it's not that, okay... Finally, we're under grace. We don't have to you know, give as much anymore. and We don't have to go as much anymore. Finally, we're out from underneath that. It's like, yes, thank God, finally, we're no longer restrained in our giving, restrained in our going. We can do even more, but we're doing it not out of a sense of obligation, not to satisfy a debt, but we're doing it because of the great gratitude that God deserves because of what he's done for us in Christ. It's not about tithing, it's about trusting. It's about being all in. It's about being fully invested. He says, stop sinning. Stop rebelling. Stop robbing. Return to me. That's repentance. But it's not only a matter of um, we return to him through repentance of sin. We also return to him through faith in God. Through faith in God. And I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but one of the primary things that this particular passage is about is about the character and nature of God. And so when we talk about, you know, God, the first thing to note is who He is. We need to have faith in who He is. And, and three things, I mean, just, just strike me as being extremely significant. One is that He is eternal. He is eternal. I mean, it was in his eternal counsel that he determined, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. It was in his eternal counsel that he said, I, I love Jacob and I will give covenant promises to Jacob and all of those covenant promises will be fully and finally uh, fulfilled in the person of my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has no beginning. He has no ending. He is eternal. Uh, the text also teaches us that he is immutable. You may not use that term very often, but it's a perfectly good term to speak of something being immutable. Well, you know, you've heard about the virus and mutations and that sort of thing. Well, to be immutable means that it's not subject to change. It's not subject to variation. It doesn't change. And what does God say? In verse 6, I, the Lord, do not change. He is immutable. Isn't that wonderful? And, and then he says, Therefore, O children of Jacob, are you not consumed? You see, why is it that he has not consumed his people? Well, because he is immutable. He, he says, I love Jacob. And he cannot now consume those people whom he has loved. He cannot now consume those people upon whom he has set his affection. He cannot now consume those people to whom he has made covenant promises. He said, I, I am immutable. I, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed. He said, this language sounds familiar. Well, you've read your Bible. Lamentations 3. Were it not for the mercies of God we would all be consumed. 
already. And what did Jeremiah conclude from that? Great is thy faithfulness. So it's not just that God is eternal. It's not just that God is immutable. It is that, that, that God is merciful. And see, we're seeing this judgment here. But we're also seeing mercy. That this eternal, immutable God is merciful and says, return to me. But let me ask you to think about something. Is it not true from, from Romans that it's actually the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It, it, it's not the wrath of God. It's the kindness of God. When we consider His mercy and His love and His grace, His kindness and His patience and His forbearance, it is this mercy of God it is this faith in all that He is that fuels our repentance and gives us that desire to return to Him. We're not being asked to return to some sort of ogre. We're not being asked to return to some sort of despot. We're, we're not being asked to return to some sort of, you know, vindictive tyrant. We're being asked to return to a God, eternal, immutable, merciful, who loves us. And we in our rebellion have gone astray. And we, thinking that we can do our own thing and look after our own selves, have robbed Him. Not just financially, but spiritually as well. And He said, it's time for you to stop rebelling. It's time for you to stop robbing. And it's time for you to return to Me. And this return calls for faith in who God is. That's what it is. What do you believe about God? Do you believe that He is eternal? Immortal, invisible, God only wise, as Walter Chalmers Smith would put it in his famous hymn. Do you believe that He is immutable? Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thomas Chisholm put in his hymn, that he is merciful. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I could credit those words to Stuart Townend, but I think he relied quite heavily on David. What do you believe about who he is? Repentance and faith. But faith is not only this believing uh, who God is, but it, it's also um, uh, believing uh, what he has promised. Who he is and what he promises are the ground of our faith. Listen to what he says here. Now, you might think this is you know, contradictory to uh, other portions of God's Word. We, we, we can have a chat about that. But, but notice what he says. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. And, and here, don't be mistaken, he's not saying put me to the test in terms of testing me or tempting me to do wrong. He is saying put me to the test, Test me to see if I will not do all that I have promised to do. You bring the full tithe into the storehouse. You, please, do so in order that there may be food in my house. 
But he said, in so doing, put me to the test. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you, and I will pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. It's an amazing thing. And I'll rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Do you believe this? These are the things he's promised. Repentance means I'm going to stop rebelling against him. I'm going to stop robbing him. And faith means I'm going to bank all my hopes on who he is and what he promises. Yeah. Let me make one thing clear as we begin to draw to a close. Lest you think, oh, well, um, <clears throat> COVID-19 must have done a number on our church finances or we wouldn't be talking uh, about this today. Oh, the, the treasury um, must be uh, not in a, a very good position or, you know, you know Barry wouldn't be uh, preaching from this text this morning. Let, let me put your mind at ease. Um, our, our church is, 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 relatively speaking, a small church. We have 60 members. Uh, when we began uh, 2020, we had 60 members. In the course of um, 2020, um, we lost three members. Uh, one died and two uh, resigned. Uh, also, in the course of 2020, we received three new members. Uh, two, by transfer from another church, and one, by baptism. Those are the facts. So we had 60 members at the beginning and 60 members at the end. But in the course of the year, our giving increased 20 why is that? We didn't have extraordinary gifts. We didn't receive legacies. We didn't have a situation where our aggregate income increased substantially. In fact, quite the opposite. We had some people who didn't receive their full stipend. We had some people, you know, who, who lost their job. Or we had some people whose hours were curtailed. And we had some people whose finances were, yeah, not so brilliant. To what do you attribute 20% financial growth? To the fact that increasingly we have a congregation of people who want it to be clear and evident. We're all in. We're fully invested. We're trusting who God is and we're trusting what God promises. And we're growing in the grace of giving. People who've never given before are beginning to give. People who've given only sporadically and sparingly are beginning to give consistently and regularly. People, you know, who, who may have just given, you know, on the odd occasion are now setting up standing orders. And this is just why. Because one of the greatest indicators of where people are spiritually is how they spend their time and how they spend their money. I mention that not to say to you, so now you need to, I mention that to say, see what God does. When not under compulsion, 
because God loves a cheerful giver, people begin to say, I'm all in. I'm fully invested. I don't have a backup plan. I'm not trying to put together an escape uh, uh, strategy or find an exit ramp. I believe who God says he is. And I fully trust in all that God promises. And I'm going to put him to the test. And he always passes the test. He always passes the test. Can any of you stand today and say, um, <clears throat> I beg to differ, I have outgiven God. No, you can't outgive him. He's rich in mercy, love, and grace to all who come to him. He's given us every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And he's added to us more temporal blessings than we can ever imagine. So that even as we were talking earlier, when maybe things are difficult, we just have to thank God because we see he's provided He's made a way. That's his faithfulness. So this is not a message about tithing, trying to whip everyone into line. This is a message about trusting, just seeking to encourage you to continue to do what you've already begun to do. Return to the Lord with your whole heart. He'll return to you. We don't have to rebel against him. He loves us. We certainly don't have to rob him. We're not going to do a better job managing the affairs of our life than he does. Just have faith in who he is and faith in what he has promised, and he'll do the rest. Well, we're going to listen to uh, our final hymn. It's to God be the glory. Now, let, just a word here before we listen. <laughs> I smiled when uh, Steve uh, showed me this hymn. Uh, because though these are recorded hymns, they are recorded live. And don't you miss those days that we used to be able to sing live, you know, together? And one of the things that you may have forgotten is that we didn't always get it right. You know, the musicians and the singers maybe weren't always in sync. And you think, oh boy, yeah, we finally got through. Well, <laughs> We're just keeping it real this morning. Our wonderful Aber singers, uh, the, the, the music and the singers aren't exactly together at the beginning, but they get there in the end and we just smile because the focus is not to the Aber singers and the Aber conference. Uh, congregants be the glory, but to God be the glory. Let's listen to this.
going to lead us in a word of prayer. And when we've prayed, uh, we'll ask you, after you've chatted uh, for a few moments, if you like, uh, from your seats, if you'll make your way through uh, this uh, uh, exit, make use of the hand sanitizing gel. If there are any books or magazines there you want to pick up, please do so, as long as you take them away with you. And then uh, we will look forward to seeing you, God willing, on Tuesday. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do say to you, to God be the glory, great things he has done. We thank you that you are eternal, that you are immutable, that you are merciful. And we thank you today that um, this this judgment uh, is something that we do not have uh, to fear uh, because you in your mercy have sent your son, the Lord Jesus, who's lived in our place, uh, the life we couldn't live, who's died in our place, the death that we deserve to die, has won in our place the victory that we could not win. And he is alive, and he's not just alive in the heavens, but he's alive in us. And so, Father, because of that, we, we don't want to rebel against you any longer. We don't want to rob you anymore. We want to return to you. Help us to do that. Help us to return to you with full confidence in who you are, with full assurance that all that you have promised you will bring to pass. Help us to return to you. We know that we're only going to find weariness. We're only going to find um, resentment. We're only going to find um, despair and uh, bitterness uh, away from you. Please, oh Lord, help us to return to you. And help us to do so by repenting of our sins. And help us to do so again by reaffirming our faith in you. And help us by your grace to stand on every promise of your word. So thank you for meeting with us today. Thank you for moving among us. Continue your work of grace in us. And give us great gladness and joy as we seek to see everyone maturing in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.